and welcome to episode 12 of the second series powered by Netball UK. As always, I'm joined by Sarah and Max. Now, now that we're allowed to meet like one person outside of our household, have you done any like social distance meet meetups or anything, girls? I've not done yet, although I am going for socially distanced walk with my friend today. So, are you, are you excited? I am. Ex- I'm so excited. <laughs> it's pathetic. Who, who knew? Eh? 2020, the year that we get excited to walk two meters away from our pal. <laughs> 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 what, what about you, Mags? Have you seen anyone? Uh, just my brother, who lives up the road from me, just popped up to see oh, him. Um, that- yeah, it was nice. Oh, I, I saw my nephew for the first time the other day and it was amazing. I haven't seen him since, and he's grown. I swear he's got feet bigger than me now. It's <laughs> mental. He's, he's only eight, um, but it is, it's nice, isn't it? That now, you know, we actually can see one person outside of our household. It is a nice feeling. It, it changes things slightly, doesn't it? Yeah, it feels a little bit different, doesn't it now? It does, it does. Um, Right then, let's crack on. Unless you've avoided all news and social media for the last 24 hours, you'll know we have some big news to talk about today, which I know Mags and Sarah both have strong opinions on. But also coming up on the show, Trans-Tasman Netball nears its return. There's plenty to talk about with the rejigged ANZ fixtures now announced ahead of the season restart. And the news that five international players have been given special government dispensation to return to Australia for Super Netball. There will be elite netball in our lives (laughs) soon. (laughs) The lockdown rules in the UK are gradually being relaxed with shops reopening, but most significantly, close contact training will be allowed for elite men's and women's sports. So what does this mean for netball and grassroots clubs? But first, we'll start with the disappointing news that the Super League, which has been suspended since March, has been cancelled for 2020 and will not return until 2021. Now it's a big decision so we've brought in Sky Sports pundit, former Wasp player, coach and England Rose, Tamsin Greenway to help us pick through the ramifications of England Netball's decision. So first off, uh, Tamsin, thank you so much for joining us because um, we know that you're very busy at the minute. You've got your hands full, haven't you? Well, um, having kids in lockdown is a bit of a shock to the system. (laughs) Easier coaching on the side of a netball court, I think. (laughs) Through, but yes <laughs> we, we won't keep you long because we know you've got stuff to be doing but um as we said a huge decision by England netball has it come as a surprise to you Tamsin I don't I don't think it was a surprise um purely when you look at just the logistics of what they were trying to manage um I think when you operate across the 10 teams how they all they all manage slightly differently from a financial point of view, from a commercial point of view. You've got, you know, only yesterday I was on a call with Netball Scotland from the international perspective. And, you know, they're working on a government that's, um, that's sort of three or four weeks behind what, uh, what we're doing here in England. You know, their phase return approach from Nicola Sturgeon is very different to what, what we're doing. So you've got that issues at Sirens. Then you've got the issues of players being out of contract in July. How on earth would a team fund, um, you know, they don't fund the players all year round. How are they going to find that extra revenue, especially when they've lost all the ticket net revenue this season? Then you've got facility issues. There are so many pieces to this puzzle um, that it's not just a case of elite sports is maybe starting back in June and July and, oh, brilliant, we can have a bit of netball. So I'm not surprised, uh, but I am disappointed, very disappointed. Do you, do you think there were other options or do you think this was always going to be the most likely outcome, really? I think there were other options, but I think um, the way netball has been in the past few years and how it's built to this point, it was always going to be really difficult. You've allowed Super League to operate in its own, although it belongs to England netball in its sense, it, all 10 franchises just operate really on their own. They're not funded from that point of view. And so um, I think the, the state of the affair of the league at the moment was always going to be difficult to come together in a crisis like this and all have the same outcome. Um, so I think that was probably one of the first issues. And moving forward, I'd like to think that that netball will start to go, well, actually, Super League is our priority here as a fan engagement and as a brand um, and that we can support them. So, you know, in terms of if England netball had had that sort of control over it, they would have been able to perhaps do a central venue or a short competition and it could have linked into the Roses programme. I think... Um, there could be plenty of options, but it would have been a massive headache to try and put those into play. And I totally understand and can see why they've had to come to this decision. And I actually think having clarity at this point is better than dragging it out to see what other options they could get. I, like, I, I completely agree because I, I think my only, frust- like not my only, but one of my frustrations <laughs> with this decision Just one. is <laughs> not like me to have an opinion on this, but <laughs> one of my frustrations is I, I feel like if they, like they could have made this decision earlier like it, it it was it was on the cards and 
nothing's really changed in the last four to six weeks that, that makes this decision any different to, to what it would have been then. From a, like, from a purely selfish perspective, having players in limbo isn't great. But what you're saying about franchises operating like as individual kind of organisations, I completely agree with. But do you think this is going to be the catalyst for something happening in Super League? Either England netball kind of grabbing hold of it and going, yes, we will fund you a bit better. And in return, we will have more say on what happens and prioritise this league a bit more. Or the alternative is we won't fund you at all and this league can go and do what it wants and sort itself out. And I think, you, you know, you know me, Sarah, we've had chats of, uh, over the years, many, many chats about this kind of thing. I've always been fairly cynical about the input into the English Roses programme, not because I don't want to see the Roses do well. I just, I think the bigger picture here is the Super League. Um, and I really hope this is an opportunity now for England Network to look at that. And I think speaking with Fran Connolly, and we actually had an interview with her earlier, um, and she was very um, open about this, talking about how Super League is then their way forward. It's something they're really invested in. There's a 10 year program and a plan around this with how they really want to push it forward. And I, I hope this is kind of the catalyst to go, right, guys, you know, it's so important because my issue at the moment is the Roses program will survive. It will carry on. It will be absolutely fine. Half the team are playing overseas. It's not a problem. Jess will get her team that she needs in, in the autumn. Um, grassroots will happen at some point when the government allows stuff to come back out. But it's that middle group that always get missed out. That connection between um, grassroots to elite is something we've worked so hard on doing for an engagement in the past two years that actually this has to be an eye-opener to go, we need everybody working together. And, you know, I'm a big fan of the Super League. Love everybody that's running their teams and what all the teams are doing. But if we want Brand Netball to survive and move forward, we have to work together and that has to be for an overall goal. So, um, Tamsin, do you, do you truly believe that the franchise directors will want that joint up working? Do you, because, because models are so different and everybody likes to do you know, their bit their way, they like the autonomy to a certain extent because then they can do it how they want to do it. Do you think that they will go for that? Let's all get together and let's have a model that works for everybody. Absolutely not. However, <laughs> and you know what it comes from? Great leadership. Yep. I've, I've been in many teams before where I've not necessarily agreed on the journey or, 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 or necessarily the way we're going to do it. But, but actually, there's a bigger buy-in and I know the end goal. And so therefore, I've gone along with that. And that's what happens under great leaders. And if, you know, the, of course, there is going to be people sort of going oh it's not the way we've done it or and you know they'll be going against it in some ways but actually if you can show them the bigger picture and I think this is where we always probably fall down a little bit in netball and it's been a bit like this decision as sorry you were saying they probably could have made the decision earlier and I really understand why they've tried and they've tried and they've tried um but I think as long as you communicate and it's the biggest thing in netball have open ideas talk to them and say this is the direction we're going and this is why yeah, it's not going to be easy for all of you. Yeah, you're perhaps not going to like this. But if you can show the bigger picture, you will get the buy-in. And I, I think, think that's probably where we've let ourselves down in the past. Well, I was going to say, I think that's a really good point because, you know, working in a franchise, I couldn't tell you what the goal of Super League is. Like, no. uh, initially, the league started to, pro like, provide England players and, and, and with a better standard of competition and for us to be, you know, more competitive internationally. Now, when you've got... You've obviously got Scottish and Welsh franchises, but you've also got foreign coaches. Why do they care about producing England players? Like, why do they care about our national team? So from its inception in 2005, that, that kind of mission statement has never really been changed or clarified to anyone. So no wonder that teams have just kind of gone with what they want and what they want to do. And now, you, like you say, you're in a situation where you've got 10 teams, all run slightly differently, all with slightly different priorities, all wanting different things in this scenario. Yeah, and it, and it has, I've sat in many meetings where, you know, I've sort of said, what is the plan? What does this look like? And I actually think it's a bigger picture that runs across all competitions, you know, without opening a massive can of worms on here. But Prem Netball, uh, where does that sit? Is that a feeder league? What happens with age group stuff? I think there's a whole bigger picture here. And I, listening to Fran earlier, I, would, I felt really positive. I thought she, she had really strong messages about what she wanted to do. She talked about Super League almost being the best league in the world um, and understood that that had a long way to go. And I think you're exactly right, Sarah, without that direction, without that understanding of what we're trying to achieve, you know, are we trying to get the best coaches in the world? Are we trying to produce players so they don't go over to Australia? Or do we realise that actually that is the only way? You know, are we trying to fund um, 
all the individual super leagues and what does that look like from a financial point of view from a tv point of view from a sponsorship point of view there are so many other questions um and i think until we start to bring that all together netball will sit in a little bit of limbo like it has done at the moment but i honestly believe it can it can get there and i'm really hoping under under fran and, and this 10-year plan that she talked about that it, it will will push forward yeah, hoping this is an opportunity for more clarity. Um, what does this mean, though, in terms of the international calendar? Does it put Super League-based England players at a disadvantage, do we think? And I throw that to you as well, Sarah and Max. Um, well, I think, uh, yeah, if, if you've got um, eight players out there that we know that are currently in the Roses programme that are playing out in Australia, they're getting that exposure. Um, the, oh, the good thing for the players back here is that they're, they're all in the same boat. It's not like the mm. Northern team are playing and the Southern teams aren't. Um, but Jess has got a bit of a headache with that. She's got to look at how she produces this next group of players because the reality is the new group coming through, your Fran Williams, your Ras Quashy, your George Fishers, they haven't had exposure in Australia yet. And yet they're going to be your next group of starting players. And so there's a big ask this year about how you're going to keep those players moving forward because Australia and New Zealand youngsters will keep carrying on. And, and how do they keep fit as well during this time? There you go, Sars. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. oh, wait. I'm sorry. Sorry, what was that, Tamsin? <laughs> um, well, you know, now I think with this announcement, the interesting thing is those players will probably get passed back to England from franchises. Um, you know, our, our programme at Loughborough will continue to run um, for a few weeks now, and then it will trail off into an off-season programme. Whereas England players can't really afford to do that if they're still trying to play something before the end of this year internationally. Um, like, like Tamsin said, England have got a, a job on their hands. You know, elite, elite training centres are starting to open and they'll be able to get into some of those. But um, it's going to be hard. And, and I think motivation-wise is now hard when they know they've not got a league. Um, yes, they've got internationals to play for, but it's going to be what we finished in March. And you, you're talking about eight or nine months between finishing playing um, the start of a Super League and then going straight into an international, which is, is going to be tough. And, and we know, you know, you said, um, Samson, that you were disappointed with the decision, but you kind of expected it. And Sarah and Mags, uh, we know that both of you are, kind of had the same view on that. Have you heard from anyone who's happy with it? Are there any players at all that have said, Do you know what, in terms of health and safety, we're okay with this? I think it, it comes back when I say I'm disappointed, you know, I'm, it's more... I'm gutted because I love the sport. Like how yeah. depressing to think, and, and being a coach as well, how depressing to think that for a whole year of my life is something that I've done for 20 years, it's just not gonna happen. Like it's, you know, that's, it's really sad. I, I think a lot of the players have been really um, realistic about it. You know, they, they understand, and there's so many different things. Like I speak to Rach Dunn all the time. You know, she's working in an NHS hospital every single day. She's not working on a COVID board, but are we really going to be going, oh yeah, Rach, you can just come to training every week, you know, and, mm. and coming in, in that closed environment. I think the players and coaches have been pretty realistic about it all, that it, it just probably isn't going to happen. But from a selfish personal point of view you want netball to go ahead and i think that's where the difficult lies because we're not silly you know this it was a really hard decision um and there were way too many outside in fact outside factors that were going to cause issues but yeah i think most players are gutted but uh from what i'm speaking to to the players at wasps it's sort of it, it is what it is it's mm. hard it's hard for the likes of rach as well though and jade and older players because to lose a season at <laughs> Like to lose the season at any time, you know, people's careers aren't that long. So to lose a season is tough, but to lose a season when you're mid to late thirties and probably coming towards the end of your career is, is really tough. A hundred percent. Like, you know, there would have been players that have been thinking at the start of this year, they were going to retire. Now what do you do? Do you, do you, do you retire or do you go, Oh, just play one more year. And what does that one more year even look like? There are young players that are coming through that suddenly started to make a mark for themselves. And you know, that season was taken away. Um, it was interesting. I was talking to Dan Ryan um, and he was chatting about Leeds Rhinos and he was talking and, and Maggie would be the same. You haven't got a benchmark of those players, how people have played this season, whether they're in form, out of form. And he raised a really interesting point. They haven't played a season out bearing in mind he's got to recruit net new players where a player might have been annoyed by sitting on a bench all year and actually yeah. got hands up, I want to move now. Like I want to, I want to do this. A lot of players will be looking going, I've got unfinished business at this team. Um, there are, there are so many issues again that are going to, that are going to create problems for players going into, into next year. 
Right off you get pregnant though. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that do you want to tell us something too? <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with that in mind, um, Tamsin, we were chatting on Netball Nation last week about, um, you know, playing netball and getting pregnant and stuff. And Sarah obviously said about the difficulty that you had um, uh, during the World Cup in 2015 when you, went, you basically had to, had to leave your child and go and play. What was that like for you? It's a really interesting one, actually. I had a big interview. Um, I, I chatted to the Telegraph about it the other week, and uh, it's it's difficult because revisiting it now, um, and I think about what I did. It was mental, <laughs> really. It was, <laughs> what was it, Sars? An eight-week training camp in Loughborough. Yeah. Um, we were there Monday to Friday, and I used to leave um, Jamie with in London on Monday. I'd come up do two days of training. I then dr- on the rest day on a Wednesday, I would drive back to London, pick up Jamie, drive back to Leicester, drop her at my parents' house. I'd then come back into camp. The girls would often have to ask for meetings to be moved so I could go back to my parents' house to bath her, come back into the hotel. Um, and I was just going backwards and forwards. And then we'd finish on a Friday. I'd pick her back up again, go back to London and the whole process would start again. Um, and that was before we even went to World Cup. Now, I totally stick by my decision that I wanted to go to World Cup. It was a completely selfish decision. That was all my choice. Um, but there was, no, there was no funding to help me take Jamie out to Australia, which I knew. So that, you know, that was understandable. I couldn't afford to take a nanny with, with me or set, put them up in a different apartment for three weeks because we were there for a good three and a half weeks, I think, for World Cup in total. Um, and I look back at it now and think, God, it really was quite a selfish decision. I would hope now as well, moving forward, female sports, actually we've got to look at that and we've got to address it. And not because, you know, I think you should be given everything if you had a kid. How, what I do think is players are playing later now. It's got to be a natural part of the game. Um, and I actually think we've got to start looking at ways of at least supporting mothers through it. Because do we really want to be, you know, female sports that just expect people to stop have kids and that be career over. So I don't think... That's what happened, Tamsin. With all due respect, you know, I'm commendable that you were able to do it. That is what the choice was. If you wanted to have a child, you knew there was no support there. You just decided, oh, end of a four-year cycle. This is me. Thanks very much. I'm off. Well, 100%. I was chatting to Sonia McLean and Jeeva Mentor about this, and we talked about, um, in all the years we were on tour, and Sarge, you'll pipe into this as well, I don't think we ever sat on a tour or a bus or a plane and talked about having kids. No. It just wasn't the thing. You, you knew you kind we of... We talked a lot about how they made. <laughs> 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 some stories and some very good talks. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, ju- I just think, I think we were really naive. And, and this is why I kind of had that conversation. And it's not to, you know, my experience wasn't negative. It just what was, is what it was. In that whole team, bearing in mind the support staff as well, there was nobody else that had a kid. So no coach, no physio, no manager, no one else had a child. So I, I, they couldn't have possibly understood what it was like. You, I totally get that now I have two. <laughs> do, you, do you think that experience, though, like we're now five years down the line from, from that World Cup, do you think that experience would be any different if a Serena Guthrie got pregnant and had a baby? Do you think that experience would be any different? Have we learned anything from it as a sport yet? I don't think we've been challenged on it. I would like to think that the discussions would be very different. I still don't think a player's done it, and so we haven't really had to stand up to it yet. Um, But I'd like to think now with Jess, with her too, and Tracy now having a baby, and with Ebony, Jeeva talking openly about kids, um, and because of the experiences that a lot of those players have had in Australia and New Zealand, where it is so open to having children and coming returning back to play, I would like to think that those discussions would be different and the only way we're going to find out is is if players start doing it and I think that's where we have to change our culture we almost have to believe that it is acceptable you know that it's it's okay that it's not something you have to put off so Tamsin let me ask you this two questions if the same scenario was repeated right now you now have two children (laughs) and it's you know it's comp games or it's a world championships would you do the same again right now that's part number one and number two being in the position you are now with Scottish netball and tours are going to come up, how will you cope with your two children going away on tours, etc.? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, we've just announced that this is my fourth comeback, right, Maggie? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> just, just let it go, T. Let it go. 
do, would I do the same thing? I'd still like to think I'd go. I would um, be a hell of a lot more vocal. Um, I think you have to remember I was in a position where, and I don't know whether England Network could have done anything more. Um, if I'd have, and it would have been really interesting to say, well, I can't possibly, if I can't have the support, I can't possibly go. I wonder what would have happened. I just think I'd have chatted about it more. I think I was very much in that mindset that I wanted to get picked. And um, it was a very ruthless environment we were in at the time. And yeah. I guess I was, you know, the same as every player. I, I wanted to go and I didn't want to be that person. And I guess because there was no one else really in that boat, you, you do feel like that odd one out. That wasn't England's network fault. That's, that was mine. And the reality is I'm, I'm six years older now, seven years older. I'd, I'd probably think about it differently. Um, I think from a Scottish point of view, it's difficult. It's tough. I, um, Claire Nelson, our CEO, is so supportive of it. She's got kids. She understands. Karen Atkinson's there, exactly the same position. And I think um, we've had the experience coming through Super League teams. You know, Jamie was always around in my storm days. Wasps were brilliant as well with her. Um, the way I see it now is when you're in charge, it's very different because you can put, produce an environment where your kids are welcomed and you can make it work. And I think people can see you can make it work. But it's very different being a coach to a player. You know, a player, you have to be a lot more selfish. You, um, you know, it would be very hard to have a kid in and around training whilst you were playing and doing. So I think it's a slightly different situation now. And, and Tamsin, just before we, we let you go, because you, you have got your hands full there, um, what advice would you give to anybody when, when you go back and look at yourself, like you say, six, seven years ago, what advice would you give to anybody in, in your position there? I, I just think that um, you have to look at it now that you're, if you're in that group and you're in that environment, you're valued. And so uh, don't ever be afraid to have discussions. You still might not get the outcome that you want. And I think I've learned to do that as a coach as well. You have difficult conversations. And just because it, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I, I just say be a lot braver about it. I think we've got to have more conversations about facility, about maternity leave, about supporting players when they return to play with, with mums and just talk about other people's experiences. Um, and even though there might not be a solution at the moment, look into the future, it's something that we want to have in there. So how are we going to strive towards that? But definitely just talk. Absolutely. Um, Max, Sarah, do you have any more questions uh, for Tamsin? I think, can I just have your baby? <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted two oh, children. <laughs> he's beautiful. He is. Well, Tamsin, thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, take care, stay safe, and fingers crossed, like you say, uh, this will open up uh, an opportunity for, for clarity in Netball. So thank you so much for joining us on Netball Nation. Definitely, no worries. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Now, it was announced in the last week that close contact training can resume in elite sports. This, along with the easing of certain lockdown rules, such as being able to play around a golf or game of tennis with a person from outside of your household. Uh, soon we'll also be able to go shopping for non-essential items. Oh, exciting. Uh, head to a car <laughs> showroom. Hey, we, we can have days out in car showrooms now, guys. <laughs> or visit an outdoor market. Um, so, Max, over to you first. With the rules on sport lifting, does it give you hope that we'll be playing netball in some capacity again this summer? You know, my heart, my heart is saying yes, yes, please. But then you move a little bit further at the body to the head and the reality of the situation is probably not. And if we do, what will it look like? Mm. You know, um, we're talking about not being able to have contact with people, although we've talked about the fact that elite sport, they're now having, what is it, three people that can train together and the there's this discussion taking place today where they're looking at expanding that a little bit more for elite sports so that they can have maybe contact um mm, so but for for the world of netball i honestly don't know and i don't even know what it's going to look like you know by the time they give us access to to venues if we ever get in it may well be that we're back to where we started dear dot outside doing uh, just one person one ball a little bit of passing and a little bit of throwing yeah. What, so, so you reckon that without knowing what it looks like, it's hard to say whether it could be a thing or not? It is, because we don't know. We, we get little nuggets of hope every day when we hear that they're relaxing, you know, something else and they're relaxing something else. But the reality for our sport is that we, we, we are venue centric. We need those venues, indoor venues more than anything, to do what we do. Um, we need to be able to have contact, but we can't. 
Um, and even playing outdoors, we need to get access to stuff like that. And, and, and it's all looking like it's just not going to happen. So yeah, I'd love to think that we're going to get some sport through the summer. Um, and yeah, I think we may get something, but what it looks like certainly won't look like competition. Well, the, dif the difficulty is as well that things don't tend, like things with this haven't really gone in order, have they? Mm. So you can't really predict what's going to happen next and what's going to be allowed next. Like all those hordes of people just crying out to go to car showrooms. Like, thank <laughs> God those are going to open. <laughs> Um, do you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't go in any order. It's just like just pick something out of the air, and right, that's the next thing that's going to be allowed. I that's think so true. Because Sarah, that's about the economy, isn't it? This is why you know yeah. the, the you know oh you can go to an outdoor market now. Yeah, but that's why I think more like a common economy. I think grassroots sport is probably going to be quite slow because it it doesn't really provide that much for the economy. Yes, it's like a massive morale boost for people, but the risks involved with large numbers even if even if it's outside like trying to kind of i don't know police that how how do you go right you can have a netball game but you can only have a maximum of 20 people mm. well then who's like i don't know it's just really it's like now sarah who's policing what's happening now because you know we talked about the fact that you know oh you can socialize with one other person from outside your household I think we can all give examples of what we've seen as we've moved about. There's mm. lots of people. Well, I mean, we're just, rules. we are officially living in the matrix. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be policing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I know there's people doing what they're doing and you know, the, the, yeah. and it is what it is because you say you can't police it, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, it is. Would, would you both Max like to enough. see it? Obviously. I know. <laughs> I feel like I we, we get, need... I, I'm getting to the point where, you know, you're trying to be really PC, but I get really cross because I think, you know, I know for a fact that if they allowed me outside with my, with a, a small group of girls, whether we just do shooters or middies or defenders, I could do some work with those girls and keep them socially isolated and do it and do it properly. Make sure that all health and safety boxes are ticked, that there's a risk assessment and be able to show, you know, the process. And it'd be auditable. Mm. But then when you see other people just flaunting the rules and just doing what they want, because they know there's no COVID police out there mm. to stop them doing it, it's really frustrating. Yeah, it becomes a very murky area, doesn't yeah. it? And people are kind of just wondering, like you say, Sarah, it's like the Matrix. It's like, what are we doing? What are we supposed to be doing and where are we going? Nobody really knows. And it's yeah. like, it's crazy. You know, you can have your cleaner come round your house, but you can't have a parent. You know, mm. it's like this... No. Uh, it, it's just um, uh, we, we shall see, and we'll um, we'll be across that on Netball Nation if we do hear anything about it. But in terms of sport coming back, uh, we're hearing obviously the Premier League uh, could be returning sort of mid June, and other sports like cricket. Um, you'll know, guys, with with your love for netball, how much people passionately care about sport. Do you think it will be something that's good for the mental health of the country? To get that back on our screens. Yeah, I, I think it definitely is. And it's definitely like a boost for people. I think what I've found difficult in this time is that people have sometimes thought that that outweighs athlete safety. Yeah. Like just get them back playing because we all want to watch something. Well, like they're still people, you know, mm. like, and, and I know like there's, there's massive economic, you know, ramifications for the Premier League and things like that. And people want to see it played for various reasons. But for us in netball, athlete safety was always number one priority. And that, I don't think that should change regardless of how much money's in your sport. And so I am happy to see sport back and I'm really excited that it's back. But I think if there's any sign that it's not going to be safe, it shouldn't come back. No, and, we're, and we're putting as much emphasis on the well-being and mindfulness of our athletes as we are on just maybe just keeping them ticking over with the fitness and the conditioning because it's huge. You know, some of these girls live for their sport. You know, they may not be academics, but they, they excel within the sport and they are truly missing it. So there has to be as much emphasis put on making sure that, that they don't feel anxious about the return to netball and that they're not forced to come back until they're ready. I agree with that, but I think, you know, we look at, I know the Premier League, you know, is, is far wealthier, um, but we've seen that it's pretty much the safest place you can be. For example, if you're a Premier League footballer, in terms of the testing, the rigorous testing they're doing, the steps that they're taking now to break them back in, and then I look at it and go, there's key workers out there that don't get that, but we're sending them back to work. 
Yeah, and I'd agree. But then there's also the question of why are you sending tons of PPE to Premier League clubs when frontline yeah. workers can't get it? Things mm. like that. And and like I said, I told like I'm excited about sport coming back, and I think it's it is going to be great for for the nation as a whole. Um, but it's a big decision, and I think mm. it's um, it's one that will continue to be debated um, because we're we're definitely not out of the woods, are we, at the minute? in terms of mm. what's happening with COVID. No, you're right. Well, talking about sport coming back, we've known for a couple of weeks that the ANZ Championship in New Zealand will be coming back in June. But this week, there was the biggest indication yet that Super Netball will soon be back in Australia. Uh, so it was announced that five players, including England Roses, Natalie Haythornthwaite and uh, Leila Gusketh, can return to Australia following a special permission from the government. Uh, Sarah, the players will be required to self-isolate in a hotel once they land in Australia. It must be like, like before you head into the jungle, you know, when people do... <laughs> I'm a celebrity that. Um, but how do you think they'll keep themselves busy through that? Or is it, do you reckon it'll just be similar to lockdown for them? Well, I think Nat Haythornthwaite's already there. So I think mm. she's in the hotel now um, receiving room service every day. Oh, can't be bad, <laughs> um, can it? No, but it, but it will be difficult because, you know, if you're an athlete and you're basically trying to train in a hotel room, um, I mean... It'll you, be hell. They're crazy, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean... It's fun, isn't it, if you're like on honeymoon for a couple of nights or something. It's not so much fun if you're trying to train and, and keep sane and, and in that situation. So I think it will be difficult for them, um, quarantine-wise. But um, longer term, you know, it's really good news for that league that they will have the sort of full quota of players to, to have a competitive league rather than one team missing two, three players and, and it kind of making the league a bit lopsided. Absolutely. And Max, how excited are you to see the return of Elite Netball? Oh, I've, I'm, I've got my Sky remote in my hand. Thinking, <laughs> can I find it? Can I find it? Yeah, of course, because, you know, it's, it's going to be some netball. Despite the fact that it's not our netball mm. Super League, it is some netball. And it's, and it's a, a fabulous, fabulous opportunity for, for other people to sort of like have a little look at what's going on across the water and watch some awesome netball yeah. played. Of course, I'm excited. It is exciting, but I guess, Sarah, there must be a level of uh, frustration for you that obviously that's, that's coming back, that's returning, but the Super League isn't. Yeah, there is, um, you know, a bit, bit of jealousy there that they're going to play a season and, and we're not. Um, but again, you can't, it's like apples and pears, isn't it? You know, I think mm. Australia's had like less than 100 deaths in total and New Zealand's been like free of COVID or whatever for yeah. however long. So it's, it's very different. Um, and I mean, that's the sad reality of it. It's like, I wish we were there so we could be playing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it is great that, that we're going to see some, some top level netball. And I think it'll kind of, you know, quench that thirst for us for a while over here. And, and Max, can you see this as almost an opportunity to draw more fans in? Oh, without doubt, because we've talked about the, the, the drought of sport. And there are some people out there that will just watch any sport and I think it's been proven that, you know, people who've never really engaged with netball previously have just come across it as they've been channel hopping and thought, oh, what's this? And they've been blown away with how fabulous the sport is. So, you know, if you were one of these people who couldn't afford maybe to go and pay to put your bum on a seat at an actual game, um, but you love the sport, you probably will tune in and watch it on television. And those are then the people who decide, oh, do you know what? I've absolutely loved watching it on television. Let's go watch a live game. Who's my nearest team? And when yeah. it does come back 2021, hopefully you get yourself a new, a new audience. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, and, and obviously we'll be across that as well on uh, every episode of Netball Nation. That is it from us. It's been quite a lengthy one today. But Max and Sarah, before I let you go, because sorry, you've got your socially distanced meeting today. I have, yeah. Um, big, big day, big day. <laughs> Planning my trips to the car showrooms as well. <laughs> what are you buying? What are you going to buy, Sarah? What are you going to buy? Oh, probably just a cheeky Lamborghini or something. <laughs> what colour? Um, what colour would you buy in? <laughs> Sick green. I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. Um, well, and, and also, Max, what's the first non essential shop you're going to go to? Oh, oh. If it was a. If this recording was going out to adults only, I'd have something oh. to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Crikey. not. It's not. So. <laughs> you know, you, you, could, you could shop online, Mags, as well. <laughs> yeah, just keep, keep those in square Discreet packaging. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mags, we love you. Um, have you got any shout-outs at all that you'd like to give before we wrap up this podcast? 
Oh, oh God, sorry, you have to go first because I'm not giving it any thought. <laughs> um, no, I guess just a shout out to everyone involved in Super League. Um, and like, it, it is a disappointing decision um, and disappointing that we won't, won't be able to get to play. But I think that what's come out of this is that netball's actually come together a lot as a sport and, and supporting each other over this time. So um, thinking of everyone involved and who's disappointed today, but um, we will get through it, be bigger and better next year. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to have to detail that and also add to that. England netball, please, please, please. This is my plea. Please take a look at the situation we're in and let's see if we can get something. You know, let's have a look at how the competition runs and if there's any way that we can bring this all together, bring all the franchises together so that should this ever happen again, we're not in this same position again. Absolutely. Contingency plan. Yes. Sarah, Mags, thank you very much for that. That's it for another big show. And we think we've covered everything you need to know, especially about the Super League announcement. As always, if there's anything you want us to cover in future episodes, get in touch. You know where we are by now. Thank you so much for listening to Netball Nation, powered by the brilliant people at Netball UK. Keep netballing at home, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. 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 This is Netball Nation.